welcome to the New York Society Library. I'm Sarah Holliday, Head of Events. In 1928, there was a major expedition to the edge of the world, and they accomplished it all without the use of cell phones. Please make sure yours is silenced during the presentation. We appreciate it. Copies of the stowaway are available for purchase through our friends from the Corner Bookstore right out of the Peluso Family Exhibition Gallery, and the author will be happy to sign them after the lecture. Laurie Gwen Shapiro is a native New Yorker who's written for most of the city's major magazines as well as Slate, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and The Forward. Her documentary film, Keep the River on Your Right, A Modern Cannibal Tale, won an Independent Spirit Award in 2000. I first met Ms. Shapiro maybe nine months ago at the circulation desk downstairs here, where I got treated to something like the first draft of the elevator pitch for this book, which had just been acquired by Simon & Schuster. I was immediately riveted by her story of an American dreamer in the 1920s who let nothing stand in his way, and by Ms. Shapiro's rediscovery of this lost narrative generations later. Reviewers have compared The Stowaway to a book by Jack London, to A Boy's Own Adventure Story, and to the contemporary works of people like Susan Orlean or Laura Hillenbrand. My favorite review thus far comes from Publishers Weekly. The reviewer says, I read nonfiction almost exclusively, and I'll be blunt, this has been a depressing year. But Laurie Gwen Shapiro's fascinating book saved my reading year, offering an incredible story and a reminder that American exceptionalism once had real meaning. Please join me in welcoming Laurie Gwen Shapiro and the stowaway. Hi, thank you for coming out. Um, I am so happy to be here and also I'm thrilled to be in New York City's, I believe it's oldest library, and thank you Sarah for inviting me. Um, what I thought I would do, uh, since I've, I've actually done, um, the book came out in January, so I've kind of worked on this a little bit, so you're actually in good shape. <laughs> so I think the best thing to do is to read a tiny bit of the introduction so you get a little taste of this narrative. And this is a nonfiction book that reads like a novel. I don't know if people love, I happen to love those kind of books. And then we have a few slides to go through and, and uh, really get you into the, the history of this. And then I'm happy to take any uh, questions. But this, is a really fun, this was a really fun story to write. I'm gonna start by put, telling you that uh, Every little word, every word in this uh, book, it has been fact-checked. And I used to write, um, when I was much younger, uh, fiction. And that was a new skill for me to learn because I didn't realize that everything had to make it through Simon & Schuster's lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> so if I say there's a tuna fish sandwich that was eaten, there really was a tuna fish sandwich <laughs> that was eaten. And one of the things I really delight in telling audiences is how I got so detailed. Because how do you get an obsolete stowaway on a ship and find out those things? And that's part of the adventure of today's reading. And I will get to that. But let's start with a tiny bit of the introduction. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to, I've also, this is why you're lucky you're sitting here because I know to skip ahead a few paragraphs. <laughs> But I, this, will, this is um, the beginning of the book. And again, it's 1928. We're in New York City. Uh, and it's August. It's a little warmer than it's out right now. And this is nonfiction. Keep that in mind. <laughs> With his back against the sunset, a 17-year-old boy lingered on the docks along the Hudson River. By his calculations, it was a 10-minute swim from where he stood to ship. The new high school graduate waited, his soft eyes fixed on the city of New York. That's the name of Berg's boat. It was moored and heavily guarded on Hoboken piers. The sun went down at 6.45 this day, August 24th, 1928, but still he fought back his adrenaline. He wanted true darkness before carrying out his plan. At noon the next day, the ship would leave New York Harbor and sail 9,000 miles to the frozen continent of Antarctica, the last frontier on Earth left to explore. He intended to be aboard. That summer, baby-faced Billy Goronsky was three inches short of his eventual height of 5 foot 11 and his voice still squeaked. You are a late bloomer, his doting immigrant mother told him in thickly accented English. 
Yet the ambitious dreamer, born and raised in the gritty tenement streets of the Lower East Side, was as familiar with Commander Richard Evelyn Byrd's flagship as any reporter assigned to cover its launch. And many people have heard of Admiral Byrd. This is the same Byrd. He left in 1928 as commander, and in 1930, when the, the expedition ends, he was already an admiral, as voted on by the Congress. So that's, that's I, we have to go with commander here, it's 1928. Um, so the Antarctica-bound Barkentine was an old-fashioned, multi-masted ship that suggested the previous century, with enchanting six square sails arranged against an almost impenetrable maze of ropes. On one, one run in icy waters in 1912, her captain had been the last to see the Titanic, just 10 miles away. He'd been afraid to help the sinking ship, as he was hunting illegally in territorial waters. Like so many immigrants, the ship once known as Samson found her name changed when she arrived in America in 1928, becoming the city of New York. She was the most romantic of the four boats in Byrd's cobbled together flotilla, and the one leaving first with greatest fanfare early the next afternoon. Several times in his mind that evening, Billy dove into the Hudson and started swimming, only to find his feet firmly on land. But he had been on board the SS New York before. Nine days earlier, he and 2,000 other New Yorkers had taken the 14th Street Ferry to Hoboken, New Jersey, and gaped at the city of New York. The crowd was wowed with anticipation. I can't say it. <laughs> anticipation. Well, you got it. And just past noon, the ship's captain, Frederick Melville, second cousin of the 19th century author Herman Melville. Did Melville ever come here? Yes, he did. <laughs> Gave the okay, waving the first sweaty guests up the gangway, their dollar emissions supporting the Bird Antarctica Expedition's fundraising drive. And when it had been Billy's turn to board, he wandered the wooden decks, still cargo free to accommodate guests. The poop aft, the rear deck, was elevated, housing Commander Bird's captain, cabin, an elegant wood panel chart room, and under the poop deck were spaces for the machine room and radio generator. But none of these places had been the right one for the hiding spot. Forward moved more promising, and here, under a second hidden shelf, Billy had spied a good sized space. The exposed top would be visible to anyone on the ship during the departure ceremonies, but his half would remain dark. Satisfied with his investigation, the lad grabbed one of the commemorative paper cups set aside as a souvenir before heading for the ramp. And years later, as we get to how I found this story out, I held that cup that he took that has little penguins on it that all the people that were trying, giving a dollar to raise money for the expedition got as a souvenir. It was very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, still on a high, Billy had walked the New Jersey shoreline until he scouted the lookout site he was in now, a long distance from the ship, but not out of reach for a superior swimmer like himself. With the twilight not yet dissipated, Billy had still had an excellent view of the many ships going up and down the brackish southern flow in Hudson. Could a ship hit him as he swam? He ate what little food he brought, an apple and an egg salad sandwich, and that's legally checked. <laughs> <laughs> um, as for what he would eat after that, he hadn't bothered to think about it. Even under the dimming sky, Billy could make out the shadow bodies of station watchmen, but he was unsure if they were Bird's crew or borrowed Coast Guard's keeping vigil. There would be no sneaking up the gangway, the narrow metal plank for boarding. He would have to swim out to the unprotected side of the ship, the side facing the water. Who would think to guard the edges of the ship away from the pier? And once aboard, he did not have a sure grasp on how he would reveal himself to Commander Bird or justify his presence on the expedition, but he trusted he could wing it. In Bird, Americans like Billy now had a super explorer of their own, someone who could proudly stand beside England's legendary Ernest Shackleton and Robert Falcon Scott, not to mention Norway's Raoul Amundsen, the crafty strategist who in 1911 had been the first to reach the South Pole, just five weeks ahead of Scott's team. The 39-year-old Blue Bud Virginian Dick Bird was a slight but strong man with a chiseled, smooth-shaped face. He looked the part of a hero and acted like one too, admired already for the responsible safety first ethics he had demonstrated exploring the North Pole by ship and plane in 1926. And now he had his eyes set 
on the south. And then I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Breathless articles in prominent publications such as Scientific American and Popular Mechanics herald the dawn of the mechanical age of exploration and ask readers with the ske sketchiest knowledge of Antarctica to imagine a pilot seeing the United States in the air for the first time, spotting a Grand Canyon here, a buffalo herd there. Was Antarctica home to animals that had never been seen, indigenous people, lost dinosaurs? And that is said with my Lower East Side accent, dinosaurs. Um, but I just want to say that you have to, I want to stop and really drive home this point that there's a heroic age of exploration we all know, Shackleton. You say Shackleton, guys, get excited, Shackleton. <laughs> but this is, that was 19, around, you know, 1911, 1914. This is 1928. So this is a very modern New York. And they're bringing airplanes. They're bringing 100 dogs like the old exp expeditions. But they're bringing radio technology. And they're bringing three airplanes. And that is what everyone is so excited about. Because even when Amistad walked to the South Pole in 1911, he was blinded. And he couldn't see what, you know, five feet away from him. But now we're flying over. Americans are doing this. We're flying over the continent for the first time. And that's why everybody was excited. Even Billy's Polish grandmother, with her rudimentary English, agreed that it was marvelous to be living in an age when men could do such things as fly over a frozen continent. So why did everyone accept his baccia, scoff, when Billy said he wanted to have a life as adventurous as bird? In the rags to riches decade of the 1920s, everyone in the paper seemed to be living big, meaningful lives from slugger Babe Ruth to fashionable Coco Chanel to comic genius Charlie Chaplin. Jews and blacks had broken through. The Marx Brothers achieved overnight fame after their Broadway debut, and provocative Josephine Baker packed them in in Paris. New York City in 1928 was rolling in the dough town, immortalized by F. Scott Fitzgerald, whose smash 1920 debut novel, This Side of Paradise, was assigned to English classes at Billy's alma mater, Manhattan's progressive Textile High School, which, by the way, my mother went to that high school. <laughs> Adults, or at least city dwellers, were having a grand old time. Only the most sober investors knew that the stock market was not on a permanent high. Even once penniless immigrants were doing better for themselves, Billy knew that he would inherit the one-man interior decorating business his father had established after arriving in New York as a destitute young man. Now that his boy would graduate in four short years from Cooper Union, a prestigious free college in Greenwich Village, Rudy Goronsky was ready to add any son to his sign. But Billy's application to Cooper Union had been decent, he supposed. He had a knack for art as well as history and languages. But who wanted to study history when you could make history? The thought of a humdrum future stuffing furniture mortified him. And now we're coming in for the end of this little prologue. Um, and then we'll get to some photos. By nearly 9 o'clock on that August night, darkness draped the sky, and lights began to sparkle on in the new downtown skyscrapers, young electric edifices from a decade of big money. From where he crouched, Billy could see the pyramid atop the Bangor's Trust Company building on Wall Street, the wedding cake-shaped 30-story standard oil building on Lower Broadway, the 40-story Ritz Tower on Park Avenue, and the first of the city's Art Deco towers, such as the New York Telephone Building on West Street, completed just months before. Great buildings that proved great things were possible. Billy stayed awake hours into the night, guessing and second-guessing the right moment to jump off the pier. Glory was not for the skittish, he told himself. Still, he was scared about low visibility under blackened skies, afraid that he might lose his way and drown. Although he easily managed dozens of river swims with his athletic father and his downtown friends. But was anyone more determined than Billy to hitch a ride on the most famous rig in America? It was the bold, he was certain, who won the right to adventure. A few minutes passed, four in the morning. He had enough waiting. The young man took a breath and plunged. <laughs> and that's where the book begins. And I'm going to tell you a tiny bit. So how uh, many, in, in 1928, Admiral Byrd, or as I said, Commander Byrd then, was one of the two most famous men in America. 
1926, he was by far the most famous man in America. And he led an expedition from Brooklyn to the North Pole. And he was not really a, a great pilot, but he was a navigator. But he was in the plane. That's all that counted. And he and his team, his, his pilot, supposedly flew over the North Pole. But right away, the nearby Explorers Club here, <laughs> people started to say, I'm not sure about that. Uh, we, we were, we, he didn't have any proof. So there was no pictures. There was no film. And it didn't really stick. But he had a ticker tape parade. So that's ticker tape parade one, 1926. 1927 is the Ortier Prize, which is the first to race over the Atlantic. And he was the easy winner. And you know he just wanted to do it to get some more publicity. As he was re getting ready to go, his plane broke down. And some gentleman named Charles Lindbergh <laughs> beat him. And no one knew who Charles Lindbergh was a week before. And he was now the man of the hour. And he had a great creep. But Bird was so loved that J uh, uh, Jimmy Walker, who was the Jazz Age uh, mayor of New York, gave him a parade too. For losing, you got a ticket to parade. <laughs> but he was very worried about his um, destiny. And remember, he, was the, he really thought that he was going to be known forever. And so he was trying to figure out what to do. And he got together with the father of um, public relations, who was a here in New York, who was a nephew of um, uh, Sigmund Freud. And they said, you know what? You should really go to Antarctica because we have, America hasn't been there. And fly over the South Pole, but take a film crew for God's sake. <laughs> and that is why this event came out. It was a scientific expedition, but if you really look at it, it was partly to keep, to, to keep his legacy alive. And by 1928, the New York Times um, had paid for coverage. And this is something that I found out that you basically could pay for coverage. You don't, you know, everything in the newspapers is not correct. Mm -hmm. Nobody would ever say anything bad about Bird. Lindbergh, Lindbergh had paid coverage, and every single day Bird was in the paper, especially in New York. There were 70,000 applicants for 60 volunteer spots. Mm -hmm. And it was the sons of the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers that wanted to go, and scientists were coming. The idea of a 17 year old boy in high school, getting a spot was not was not on, <laughs> and that's that's what a little bit more background. I want to just start a few slides. So this is Billy Garonski as a young boy. If you, if I I'm a mom of a 15 year old, and if I you know my son was dressed up, he would not get out of the sailor suit. You know you're in trouble. <laughs> he wanted to be a sailor from as as young as he could remember, and this is a Francesca. And uh, Rudy and and Billy and uh, can you guess where this is? Because they're coming from the Lower East Side, Coney Island. Coney Island, the F train out or whatever. I, I don't know if it was the F then, but this was um, taken there. And they were. He was raised as an only child, although Rudy had a uh, had had a wife back in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They were Polish Catholic. There was a very big enclave of Polish Catholics in the Lower East Side. A lot of people think of Ukrainians, but there was a Polish, and they eventually made a lot, a lot of money, and many moved out to Bayside, many moved to New Jersey, um, some moved out to uh, Brooklyn, but this was the community that he was in. But I'm from the Lower East Side, and I will tell you that Billy had a real knack for languages and could speak Yiddish. And so he later on, he would get a job as what we call a Shabbos boy. He was the guy that would light up so his languages come into play as well in the story. This is one of my favorite little uh, uh, photos. In 1925, he was a rap scallion kid. He was really, he was really smart. But he, um, there was a contest. They were trying to get animals to be protected in New York. You know, uh, homeless animals, the ones like we would have now in the shelter. And this is Tootsie. <laughs> And this is a, a Milkman's horse in the Lower East Side. And he convinced the guy to let him train to have Tootsie ride the horse. And he won the contest for all of New York and got into his mother's scrapbook. And that scrapbook becomes very important to me. But this is the first entry in the, in the scrapbook. 
And recently, there were rival articles on the stowaway in the Daily News and the New York Post, and I knew the date that he won, and the Daily News used their own photos. They couldn't believe it, that from 1925, they told him the date, and they had pictures of Billy winning this contest at the age of 15. So <laughs> they didn't have to pay any money, which really made them excited, because they owned it. So this is where he was living. Um, in 1928, what we think of as now as the East Village was really part of a larger Lower East Side. And this is East 11th Street, and I can guarantee you those apartments now are about 5,000 a month. But this was a tenement back then. And I've been to all, all of the places that he lived, um, including where he lived, he moved later as a teenager to Bayside. I've been to all of his homes. I've had tremendous luck with this project, I have to say. Okay, before we get to the ship, I'm going to take a break and tell you how do I have this knowledge? Because now we're going to, now we're going to get into some things you need to know. So I was, I used to write fiction when I was younger. I'm also a documentary maker. And I was, I felt stuck as a woman in my, write, in a writing rut. People wanted to publish books of mine, but they wanted me to publish wacky novels that I was writing in the 1990s that I don't even read. You know, like, what? <laughs> but I was getting a lot of luck as a documentarian. I have big stories. I've been to the Amazon. I've been to New Guinea. And I thought, what if I, instead of doing a documentary where you do also experience a lot of sexism as well, it's been very successful, but at the same time, it's hard, as anyone in the film industry will tell you. I thought, I want to just write a book. And also, another thing happened to my life is that I have an elderly father who had kids late in life. My mother passed away um, about 10 years ago, but my father now needed to not live by himself anymore. He's now 97 years old, so he's moved into my house. I can't go off to New Guinea. I have to have a project at home. So I had the idea that I was going to just find a story that read like fiction. I knew I'll find it. And my, I convinced a new agent, because my old agent said, oh, I could just sell one of your wacky novels. <laughs> I got a different agent. And she said, I know you'll find it. You'll know it when you find it. So just practice, 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 practice. And I started writing about the Lower East Side and the East Village where I live and grew up. And I found out about this church that was 100 years old. That was a Polish Catholic church. It's the oldest Polish Catholic church in New York City out of um, 24 Polish Catholic churches. And I was looking, and I saw a uh, article. I was trying to just write a history, like for 200 words. I was going to do the New York, New York Times blog post. They had a little East Village. On, you didn't really get the print, but you got online credit that said New York Times. I was like, that's good enough for me. <laughs> and I just thought, I'll practice with that. And I'll just practice on this church and do a, a brief history of the church. And I was going through old records. Um, online, uh, looking at the New York Times, if anything popped up, and one little article popped up, and it said 500 kids are marching uh, from Tompkins Square to City Hall to greet the Polish stowaway kid. And I just put down my, <laughs> my, glass, my reading glasses, and I just said, I don't know what this is, but I think this could be it. And I thought, as a documentarian, I had to use my skills. Um, because I knew that like a writer might not know that you can find people. You have to look for them and get descendants and flesh out the story. So this is where being a filmmaker became very handy. And I made this cockamamie Excel chart with all the Goronskis up and down the seaboard. At first I couldn't find anything about him. And I realized that people couldn't handle a Polish Catholic name back then. And every, I thought, what if they spelled it like Karonski? And I got a few more hints, you know, like the way, no matter how I spelled it. But it wasn't enough. I needed more information. It wasn't enough for a book. So I thought, if I could find a descendant, I'm in, I'm in a much better place. And I would call people up, and I'm a caffeinated person most of the time. <laughs> but I had a big cup of coffee, and I said, hi, I'm a writer, and I don't know if you're possibly descended from a kid who swam in the Hudson River in 1928 and went to Antarctica with Admiral Bird. Click. <laughs> and this went on for the, like, all morning. And my husband was, in the, was working from home that day. He was just laughing. He's like, you're crazy. This isn't, this isn't going to happen. Number 16, and I have it circled. I did this spiel. I did the same thing. I called a lady. This time I was like, well, this one isn't Cape Elizabeth, Maine. 
and that's by the ocean. And he liked the ocean, maybe he was by the ocean. And I, she answered the phone, it was an elderly lady, and she said, and had a Polish accent, and I thought, wait a second, this isn't gonna be anything, because he was born in New York City. His <coughs> descendant is not gonna have a Polish accent. And I went through the whole thing, and at the very end I heard, how was my husband? And that was the moment I knew I had a book going on. She said, I have everything. Um, elderly woman get to Maine, and if you get to Maine, I have scrapbooks, I have photos, I have stories, I was his wife 40 years, and I'm a non-driving New Yorker, like really, I got my badge, you know. I got to Maine, I got to Cape Elizabeth within two days. I told my agent what book I wanted. I had, I had the story all mapped out in my head. I didn't know how much more I had to do, but I had a book deal. It went to auction, and I had a book deal within six weeks. So it was really that extra effort of doing your documentarian research, and she that's how come I'm able to get into so much detail. I have his birth certificate, his death certificate, I have his high school yearbook, I have letters from his girlfriend, I have his mother's scrapbook, and articles that you can find in the library, and I'm a very good researcher, but even the articles when you go to the New York, New York Public Library, you're gonna get the New York Herald Tribune, you're gonna get you know, some old papers. There, there were dozens of papers in New York City that we just don't have records on. And those were giving in lots of details. So now we, now we can move on. This is the city of New York without its mass up, and this is when it was docked in Hoboken. You can see, it's very hard to see, but there's the Empire State Building. Well, no, it's not the Empire State Building because it's not 1930 yet, but it's one of the the skyscrapers. The Empire State Building was finished in 1930. That's how come I just figured that out. <laughs> um, and this was the, the flagship of the four boats going to Antarctica. Okay, Billy's a great character because he swims across the Hudson, and I'm not giving away the whole book. This is really front-loaded in the front because you have to know that he's not the only stowaway on this trip. He gets across, the, and there's two other stowaways that are, and so this is this is one of the craziest part of the story. And it sounds like a joke, because he's Catholic, he's Polish Catholic, there's a Jewish stowaway, and there's a black stowaway, and they're all <laughs> white. <laughs> and, and they they basically um, were arguing over who got to be the right, who got to be the stowaway, and that's how they were discovered. At, like, after they were all the way out by the Statue of Liberty, and I tracked a lot of press. I tracked the Jewish press, and I tracked the black press. Everyone was a hero according to their ethnicity. But I, my favorite find was in a Macy's ran an ad in the New York Times to be like the Jewish stowaway, to clean underwear, because he showed up with a suitcase. <laughs> and Billy was naked when he arrived. And, <laughs> and the black stowaway, who's Robert Langmuir White, who's a really interesting character, he wanted to be the first black man to go to Antarctica, and he took a rowboat, and he got in. But Billy was wet and naked, so uh -huh. he, was, he was the youngest. This was the, so he stowed away several times. He got caught. This is another boat. This is the supply ship, the Eleanor Bowling. And Eleanor Bowling is the name of um, Richard Byrd's mother, Virginia. She was living in, um, she was actually in Boston, lady who married into Virginia. Um, there was no money on this expedition. American government did not provide money for the bird expeditions or for them until the third expedition. Everything was promotion, promotion. So someone painted on the side of the boat bowling with one L instead of two L's, and Bird was like, oh, you just can't, we're gonna go with that. <laughs> so that's why you have bowling with one L. And he then was caught there. That was in Gowanus. Does everyone know where Gowanus is? This is where the, so this is even figured nobody's gonna catch me at the supply ship. But they caught him. He then went down to Virginia where they, it was refueling and he was discovered again. And this time Bird was just laughing. But his unexpected ally was the governor of Virginia, who was Richard Bird's brother. And he said, you know, that stowaway kid that's lots of publicity value in him. And so they said they were gonna let you go. They, they said he was gonna let him go. And meanwhile, just as he's about to go, his father shows up, hysterical, and he kind of arrested. 
So this is all sorts of tension. But it, I will, obviously, the name of the book, the subtitle, is A Young Man's Extraordinary Adventure to Antarctica. So I'm not ruining anything I say. He does get to go. But right here, he's 17 years old. He's wearing a black hat. And that's where he is. This is on the supply ship. It's where he got a birth originally as a mess boy. And later on, he proved himself in the, uh, in the stoke room. It was really hot. And that really pleased Bird to no end. This is inside the supply ship at Pulanis when they're packing things up. 70 men, no women. Although when I went to the bird files in Ohio, I pulled files that no male writer on Antarctica has ever pulled, including the women's letters. There were dozens of women and girls who wanted to go to Antarctica. This was the age of Amelia Earhart. Oh. And no one has ever written about that. And I also pulled the stowaway file, which you no know, one, it was a file for everything. Bird really thought he was going to be as famous then, now as he was then, and he kept everything. So there was lovely correspondence about the stowaway I was able to add to my knowledge. This is a great photo. This is the city of New York leaving the Hudson River, leaving New York Harbor. Now, based on what I've told you, you know there's three stowaways that are underneath here. They haven't been discovered yet, because they didn't get discovered until Staten Island. <laughs> That's yeah, around there. And this is um, Bird was uh, actually doing a promotion on this trip, and then he was going to take a train across to LA to leave with a whaling ship that was leaving with 100 dogs. So he was on there. There were a lot of dignitaries on there. Um, old books said that Amelia Earhart was flying over, but I discovered that Amelia Earhart was on the ship at this time. Because Amelia Earhart um, uh, was the mistress of Bird's publisher, Putnam, Chip Putnam, oh. and you might have heard of Putnam Books. So Amelia Earhart was told to help promote, because this was one of you know, his, his buddy. And of course, Bird's books were published by Putnam. And so the, here we are, New York, about to be discovered. And I know this is 10 minutes before Billy was discovered. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great photo, too. This is our six Boy Scouts about a week before the uh, boat is leaving. Um, there was, had been a contest in England uh, for uh, Boy Scouts. I think it was Shackleton or Brendan Scott, actually. I have it in the book. I have to check. But they ran a contest, and it was a very popular thing, and a scout got to go to the, to the South, uh, Antarctica back uh, around 1911. And they thought, well, we can use this. And they ran a contest for America's Boy Scouts, and one youth person was going to go. And 800,000 Boy Scouts applied. <laughs> and this is narrowed down to the six. And, and Bird is putting all sorts of tests on them to pick it. And the guy who won is a bit of a ringer. His name is Paul Seipel. And he's right in the middle. He's very tall. He's the number, on the bottom in the middle. And he wasn't the worst pick. I gotta be honest, because if you've ever heard the expression wind chill factor, that comes from Paul Seipel. But Paul Seipel had his own book deal with Putnam uh, before he left. <laughs> and now there's a rival youth, I mean, which is more exciting, the Boy Scout or the stowaway who swam across the Hudson River? So he's not happy. And so there's some tension in this book. But if you, if I have had a lot of letters from old Antarctica buffs, and, you just cannot insult Paul Seipel because he really went on to a storied career. But it was really interesting to me that people said, well, why didn't you write a book about Paul Seipel? It was one or two letters. And it's like, because Paul Seipel didn't jump into the river. <laughs> he, does, he has a very incredible career, and that's part of the book as well. I just throw this in because this is a little tidbit. I'm a cat person. And this is a cat named Ele Eleanor. Remember, that was Bird's mother. And she climbed on the supply ship um, in Gowanus, in Brooklyn. And this is the only cat in American history. She stowed away to Antarctica <laughs> and came back. So this is a very illustrious cat. And I just I like to just get some cat time here. <laughs> That's Eleanor Bowling, the cat. This is George Tennant, who was a cook who had gone to the North Pole and was a good friend of Bird. That's Igloo. Now, you don't know that dog, but that was the most famous dog in the United States. Um, that dog was the most traveled dog. That was Bird's dog. And he'd gone to the North Pole, been to the South Pole, been everywhere. There were books for Bird, uh, for the dog. There were stuffed animals. So he was going to the Antarctica as well. 
This is another cat. But George was the, the cook, and he didn't like all these highfalutin people that were applying for the spots. You know, the, the scrub boys were like Harvard boys. And here comes Billy Goronsky, and he loves him, because he's, he's like, this is an authentic kid. So that was one of his allies, and he got into Bird's ear as well about getting him into the mess hall. And Bird loved loyalty, and all, this, all the people on the expedition loved him, because he, he, not only did he keep stowing away, he went down to Virginia, and they just thought this, he's so, he, he, he brings a smile to the men's face. So this was another mentor, the, the cook, George Ten. And also, one thing I found out is almost everyone on this expedition was a Mason. And he was, even though he didn't have the education of many people, he was a Mason as well. Hmm. This is at the barrier, uh, 9,000 miles away. And this is uh, a gentleman that's falling into the water. There was another New Yorker on this trip um, who was Jewish. He was the only Jewish person on the trip. And he, he was the airplane mechanic. And um, he fell into the water. And Billy, who was a very great swimmer, and I'm going to tell you why in a second, was one of the first to jump in. And that was when Bird really started to admire him, besides just being a novelty. Now, you need to know why Billy is such an amazing swimmer. First of all, people used to swim in the rivers of, off New York. My 97-year-old father is the best person to have in the house when you need to fact check how used, people used to swim in the river. <laughs> he goes, what do you need to know? <laughs> and he, was in the East, he used to be in the East River. But the Polish Catholics of New York City did not have, in the early 20s, there was no Poland uh, at that point. Poland had existed before, but it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they wanted to keep their men strong and their boys strong in case Poland became a country again. And they formed these organizations called the Polish Falcons across the United States. And each, each um, uh, Polish Falcon group was called a nest. And New York City's was nest seven. Nest, you know, like a bird, falcon. And um, Rudy Goronsky, was an upholsterer, but he was the president of the Polish Falcons. And his son by, by, you know, was going to be an example, and he was taught how to swim at a very young age. And they would go out to Coney Island as well, and if you've ever seen those uh, crazy people out there, like, you know, those were those Polish Falcons that started that tradition. So by the time he was swimming across the Hudson River, he'd been swimming like a, like a fish since he was four years old. And this comes in handy to get Bird's favor. This is, um, I'm going to tell you that this, this is a little bit, uh, this is a, a, a poster of Bird at the South Pole, which you can watch on YouTube for free if you're interested. Mm -hmm. It was the only film to ever get an Oscar for cinematography, not as best documentary, but cinematography. It was shot um, mostly silent with some sound. And again, the whole reason for that photo was shot by Paramount. Were two, they sent two people along, was to make sure that nobody did, uh, didn't believe Bird that he went to the Antarctica and they flew over the South Pole. Mm -hmm. And this was a Rear Admiral Bird, so this is what he's coming back. When he went, flew over the South Pole, Congress, while he was on ice, voted him into a, an admiral position. And this is part of the menus in New York City. Um, I found them in the New York Public Library. I also, have, his wife had copies. His wife has, a, she was like a, 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 amazing, she had copies of everything. Here is Billy uh, in, when he's 18. This is how I got, how detailed I got. These are the, uh, he, Bird knew what he had. He had a kid that caught America's imagination and he went international as well. He was a very popular story in New Zealand, in Poland, in England. And this is a copy of a speech he did for WOR, which still exists. But he was sent back in the middle of the expedition to be the first person to talk about it, the stowaway report. And this is in his typing with his changes. Wow. Um, and that's how I know what time he jumped into the water, uh, 4 a.m. That's how I know a lot of things. And that was how I was able to satisfy um, Simon Schuster's lawyers. And he also gave speeches to Textile High School. He had been in the history club. And now he was history. And I have, because of his widow's un unbelievable love for her husband, and that's a story, that was her second 
Um, you know, she was his second wife. The first marriage was not a take. So she, that's why she's alive. She was 20 years younger than him. But she was the love of his life, and she kept everything. And those, this is an example of the kind of speeches I had. So, 1929, what happens in you know, America? <laughs> Crash. So when they left New York, it was the jazz age. It was roaring New York. And this, is the, this picture really pretty much signifies the end of the 20s because we, there was a lot of attention on Bird, but the, the stock market crash happened in October of 1929. They come back in 1930, okay? What allowed Bird to have number three ticker tape parade, the only person in American history to have three ticker tape parades, is that his buddy was mayor of New York, Jimmy Walker. And so he said, don't worry, don't worry, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get you a parade. You know, and it was the beginning of the Depression. Things got worse with the Dust Bowl. You know, it really didn't hit New York in the same way until around 1932. People were starting to really worry about jobs, and all these people had volunteered for his expedition. Bird's next job was having to get jobs for all these people who had volunteered for two years. I mean, it was a nightmare to come back to. But this is when they're trying to act like nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the parade down uh, Broadway. And there was over a million people there, as you can see. And he's, all the people that went, including Billy, are, are in the cars that follow Bird. Here's City Hall, where uh, he, they were given awards as well. This is a great photo. Wow. This is, has, does anyone know the St. George Hotel in yes. Brooklyn Heights? So this was on his widow's um, wall in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. No one's ever seen this photo. This is, they had so, everyone around the country, like I'm on my sixth reading right now, right? But this was, this was like, they did like 30 events in the first month. <laughs> and nobody, they couldn't get enough because it was like the, the you know, that everyone wanted good news in the Depression. So they did in the St. George uh, a dinner for the Brooklyn guys, or five of them, and they thought, well, Billy's good enough, and he's the stowaway. You know, he was really a popular character. He was very, very famous at this particular moment. I can tell you that it's easy to spot Bird, even though this is a slide, because he's in white. He's, he was wearing his navy, so he's standing over there, right under the flag, and Billy is right in front of him as on the dais is one of the five people of honor. And um, the, I checked it with a magnifying glass with his wife. He goes, oh, there's my husband. <laughs> and so she didn't even know where he was in the picture, but we figured it out. We blew up his face. And this is going to um, the Brooklyn Historical Society, I believe, upon her death. There was. So here we're getting to the end of the slide soon, so then I'll be taking questions soon. But there were all sorts of telegrams I also have. Um, I got telegrams in Ohio where the bird archives have. She had telegrams. This one is very curious because he wanted to be something other than an upholsterer. And so he decided after being surrounded by some of the top scientists in New York went to, in the country went on this trip. He wanted, he, Bird told him, you really, you're not going to get far without a degree. So now everyone's looking for a job, and Billy thought, well, maybe I can apply to college. Instead of Cooper Union, I can apply to, I want to be an explorer. I'll go to Columbia University. So this telegram is asking him, um, I can read it for you. Dear Admiral Bird, receive two letters. May I come up tomorrow? My future work in college depends on you. Would like personal interview, please. Answer sincerely, Gavronsky. Bird spelled his name Gavronsky, and, Bert, and Billy Gavronsky never wanted to correct him, so all the papers have a V instead of a W. <laughs> um, and Bird thought, I could do this. It's hard to get jobs for people. Even Captain Melville was living on the bread line at this point. I mean, all of these people that were at household names like baseball players, every, was, their, names were, their pictures were published every day. They were all on the bread line. He said, I'll, I know the head of um, Columbia University. And I think Billy Garonsky had what is possibly the best reference letter of all time in application that his summer job was Antarctica 
uh, exploration and his reference letters from Admiral Richard Byrd. <laughs> and you better believe he got into Columbia. <laughs> but the depression worsened. And I actually have a big article coming out in, I believe, September in the Columbia University magazine, alumni magazine, because they didn't know about him. And so I, uh, because he had to drop out, because he had to help his parents, because the parents had supported him and, and not disowned him, even though he was all, his face was on the front of the New York Times as the stoic kid. <laughs> I mean, I have a 15 year old, and I can imagine if my daughter swam across the Hudson, I wouldn't be very happy with her, even though I loved her. But they, so there's a very interesting, the, this book not only is 1928 to 1930, but it transitions into the 1930s and how America changed once again. And the photo I showed you before, the parade is the end of the 1920s. And now we're really in the 1930s. When he dropped out, I think there's about three more slides. When he dropped out, um, to get any work, he couldn't get any work. And the only way back was the sea, because he had a more, more advantages than anyone else. In, in like, even getting like mopping work was hard. You know, he looked at it was hard, but he went down to the seaport every day. He went to all the ship, uh, ships along um, the Hudson River, and they knew who he was. And he got work um, as a very, you know, just, just mopping the deck, and. That was paid work, and then he was very well spoken. He was very seasoned, and they made him, uh, you know, uh, gave him a little bit more work. And he was hired by the SS Manhattan. I don't know if anyone's ever read Unbroken by Laura Hillebrand, but that features very heavily when the American Olympic team is going to the Nazi games. And that's this. So this is where you go. This actually becomes very important because it's going back and forth to Germany. Now, I told you that Billy grew up on the Lower East Side, and he was good with languages. He speaks German fluently. He speaks Yiddish fluently. He's Catholic. And the wealthiest Jews got out. Not all of them, but not this, many got out from Germany, taking ships and coming along from 1933, 1934. They started to get out. And they were talking to Billy on the ship, who was speaking to them in either German or Yiddish, and they were so impressed that a non-Jewish boy, such a mensch, could be on the ship with them, they started to talk to the officers. And he was asked by the officer, and the captain said, you know, you're officer material. And he became a third mate, and then he became a second mate, and then he became a fir first mate. And that is because of his experience at sea, and his experience as a Lower East Sider who lived in a very multicultural neighborhood. And I'm going to end my slide here because William Goronsky was one of the youngest sea captains of World War II. And here you have a picture of a stowaway who became the captain of his own ship. Wow. <laughs> and that's part of the story as well. Wow. So I thought, oh, that was an older, sorry, let me go back. <laughs> so I'm going to take any questions. I, I, I gave you a lot of information. But I wanted to really give you a taste, because you have me present, a lot of the backstory, there's a little bit of an author's note, is not in the book. You know, there's a, the author, but the idea of how much research had to go into this to get a simple story. And I actually researched his life, and I will give you an addendum before I take questions, which is that his wife was not the only source. I told you he was married before. He had two kids with this wife, who, who was a, it was a very terrible relationship. And the kids got very heavily in dr into drugs uh, in the 1960s. They moved to Florida. And they got caught up with heroin, with all sorts of things, and um, were really terrifying the family. And at a certain point, he was a sea captain. He gave them money, and he cut off communication. And from the second wife, and he was threatening the wives, and they moved him away. They didn't give any addresses. And his wife had thought that they were both dead in jail. That's all I knew when I started this book. I had William Goronsky and Billy Goronsky on Google Alert. One day, a year into writing this book, William Goronsky goes off. And I thought, oh no, someone has my story. Who the heck has my story? And it turned out there was a picture of a man who was moving jails 
and his name was William Gronsky, and I looked at the photo, he was in his 80s, and he looked a lot like him. I've seen pictures of him older because I have his wife's photo albums, and I thought, oh my gosh, his oldest son is alive, and he's in jail, and he's up for parole. And so I got in contact with the Florida jails, they wouldn't let me come, and finally I kept saying, this is the youngest member of the first expedition to, American expedition to Antarctica, and he's the only person that might know him besides the wife, and she, he would know much more. And I got nowhere, and then finally I got someone on the phone in Florida, and I said, are you a Shackleton fan? <laughs> I told you, Shackleton is the open sesame for men in Antarctica. And he goes, I am. <laughs> and we got into a conversation, he said, let me see what I can do. And he got me permission to go to um, uh, this maximum security prison in Florida, and he hadn't had a visitor in many years, and he gave me a lot of information. He hasn't had drugs for 30 years. He had, had grand larceny. He didn't kill anyone. But he was a very smart person who probably had ADD. I, my guess is that Billy had ADD, which is one of the reasons he was such a, you know, this is the way that he shaped up at sea and his sons got into drugs. Um, and he had much, a lot of information that the wife didn't have. And I, I, she was shocked when he was alive. And it, one of the things, one of my crazy details in here is that there was a crystal ball that his grandmother had and that his grandmother said, when everybody was making fun of him wanting to go to Antarctica, she said, I see you in Antarctica. <laughs> and I thought, that's too rich a detail. I asked his wife, and she said, how did you know about the crystal ball? And she, it was like this woman from the old country with her amulets and a crystal ball. And I will tell you that that is the kind of detail that I was able to put in and other bits. And so the story got even richer. And he has just read the copy of the book in jail. And he wrote me a letter and said that he sold his father's Medal of Honor for drug money years ago. He felt that he had disrespected his father. And now, as an octogenarian, he was able to give his life some significance and respect his father now. And he felt so proud that he can contribute to American history in any small way. Um, and I'm about to say a question, but I will tell you one piece of good news, which keep it in the room. But I just signed my film deal for oh. the story today. <laughs> so I was just talking to someone, and we hope that that crystal ball is going to end up in that in the film. If it happens, you never know. But are there any questions? His widow gave you access to. I saw some, one thing had a little AP note at the bottom. I or. got a lot of info, I got a lot of photos as well from eBay. eBay was a very rich source for me okay. because a lot of press photos were discarded. Right. This was a big story, and unfortunately, 1928 is not out of copyright yet. So my biggest nightmare on this book was not the writing i loved writing this book this was i got to go oh i should have i went to antarctica as well <laughs> because i felt like even with all this stuff i needed to own the story and i i was in antarctica and i followed his trip for for six weeks uh, i left from new zealand like the old explorers i went down to the raw sea my husband was furious because i left him with a teenager <laughs> but I will say that that does also help the story because I was able to add details that I could not have written in, like the smell of penguin dung is like a big cow barn smell, or the light is not just shining white, there's pinks and, you know, like the, the, the time of the year I was there at the exact same time. And so this was an incredible writing experience. But the worst part of this book was clearing photos. <laughs> it's a real nightmare. But I got hired, I, I caved in and finally hired someone to help me clear the photos. And um, so we paid the Times a lot of money for some photos, the AP for some. But some of these photos that you see are not in the book at all. I have h hundreds of photos. But they don't have to be cleared because I'm just showing an audience. So. You, um, but it's interesting, it's a combination of photos from old newspapers, mm -hmm. discarded press photos from 1928 mm -hmm. and 1930, and going to Ohio State. His wife, who is sick right now, but she's okay, she's not, she's just had like pneumonia for this winter, but she is on the upswing, I heard. But she has, to protect her, the archives, 
She has donated to the Joseph Malutsky Institute in Brooklyn, which used to be in the East Village, which has now moved out to Brooklyn, and all of the photos are there, and all of the scrapbooks. And so she, they, she didn't have any children with him, because she was an artist, and she was in World, she was hurt in World War II in Poland. That's where he met her as a captain in Ford. And he wanted to be with someone who cherished his heritage, unlike his first wife who made fun of his Polish heritage. So that is where I got a combination. I mean, this is, I worked on this from, I, so I can tell you 2013, my New Year's resolution was I'm sick of writing chick lit and wacky novels, <laughs> and I have this documentary career, and I'm, I need to come back in a different way. I want to find a book that's going to break me through. I'm a, I'm a, I need to be in charge of my destiny as a, as a woman, and not let everyone tell me what I have to be. I let go of my agent, and I found an agent who believed in me as a nonfiction writer. And the story, I just immediately started practicing, as I told you. I found the story in March. I had a book deal by April. It's now 2018. I worked on it for four years. I was uh, one year of research, just reading. I mean, who am I to write about Antarctica? I had a lot of reading to do. And I also had to go to Antarctica. I mean, you could tell my husband I had to go to Antarctica. <laughs> because I said to him, if Norman Mailer told his wife that, you know, I'm going to Antarctica. She said, no, you know. <laughs> and you know guys know what happened with Norma Mailer. <laughs> and I just said, as a woman, I have the right to do this. And my husband is lovely. I know. I'm just saying that it was interesting because a lot of the money, one third of my advance, you get half of your advance up front, was just immediately not going into my mortgage. It was going into, but as a woman, I felt I deserved to have the authority. And in much of my publicity, people are talking to me. It's been in National Geographic, it's been in the Wall Street Journal, and people say, oh, she's been to Antarctica. <laughs> and a lot of that is really, that gives me the authority to talk about this, because I do know what it's like down there. Yes? How old was he when he died? He was in his 70s. I will tell you that one of the promotional uh, brands was Chesterfield. Mm. And all of the men were completely addicted to Chesterfields their whole life, including Billy, starting at 18. And he did not drink as a captain. That was one of the things, but he did smoke. And it was smoking related. I was 76. Yeah. So um, I even say partly it's to blame for his death as well. <laughs> Um, but his house is still in Cape Elizabeth. Everything is there. He was a very learned man from the, you know, because he learned from the people on the ship were some of the smartest people in America. And he had classical. I have all his books. I have his library. I took pictures of his classical music collection. And his wife is just keeping it there as almost a shrine. And the the kitchen is set up as a galley, like a ship's mm -hmm. captain. And that's where he died in his galley. Mm -hmm. What, what made them move up to Maine, you know? Well, they lived in north, north, um, the north tip of, north, what's the name in Long Island? North, 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 north Port. North Port, North Port. Um, for a while, he also had a gardening company because he learned a lot about botanicals on this trip with his wife. And um, then he just really wanted to be closer to, you know, he, he was a captain and he was getting work up in, Maine. And then what really made them move was he wanted to get away from the, the threat of the sons on heroin and really just wanted to kind of drop out. And they didn't give them any forwarding addresses. Um, I have to say, one of his, his younger son did die in jail from drug, but I have have a very unusual friendship with his younger son. And he's actually, I'm not afraid of him. He is in jail. He will. Florida has very strict laws, so they doubled his sentence. He did not get up, out parole. They're making money off of the prisoners, many of them. And he's an 85-year-old man who hasn't done anything in 30 years, but he's a, it's a private, like they, they make a, a certain amount of money for every uh, prisoner. So they're not going to let him go. And he's, he'll die there. Any other questions? He'll, he'll die in jail. Oh, he'll die. Yeah, he's on a 30-year sentence, but 
I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, if he came, came out, I would be amazed. But he's so, I do have a relationship with him where I'm able to call him and write him letters. I send him stamps. And I never thought I would have a friend that's in a maximum security prison. And, and, but I will tell you a very funny story. I used my skills to track the descendants of the Jewish stowaway and the black stowaway, who were also part of this. And um, I was able to find the Jewish stowaway's son. And I will drive, and I had to get to this prison, and I found out he lived in Tampa. <laughs> and so the two sons that were fighting in 90 years ago met up in prison. He drove me to the prison. And they met 90 years later in prison. And that was quite a remarkable moment. And then he let me have a private interview with him. But um, I found that that was a great way to interview him. Um, and I was able to find out a lot of details about his, his father, who so I wrote an article recently for the New Yorker called The Stowaway Craze, and it was in the 1920s, this is what people were doing, like Instagram stars. This was an instant way to get press. And even women and girls um, would stow away, present themselves to the captain, very beautiful ladies, and they would have a film deal by the end of the trip. You know, like the stowaway gal. And I mean, it was amazing. There were 500 stowaways in 1927. <laughs> Yes, I think that one of the things that's really fascinating is I didn't, I'm, I have a very chatty, strong voice, and I didn't want to put myself in it too much because there's so much going on, and it wasn't my story. I had a cover note, so I did an author note. But what I've tried to use is the story for readings like this, for publicity. Um, I want, you know, and it's, it's a calculated effort. I made a, um, a shorter book. It's not short, short, but it's. But I cut out. I mean, I did another. I cut 75 pages mm. with all the sons and the prisons, and you know, it was just like this was an upbeat book, and I didn't want to bring. This wasn't about the 1960s. This is really about the 1920s, and it was such a clean narrative of a stowaway that becomes the captain of a ship, and so part of the choice is like this is what I. If anyone is a writer here. This is what you call slice of life biography, which is a real trend in writing now. Um, I'm not writing about Abraham Lincoln. You know, I don't need to write a 500 page book. This guy didn't do what Abraham Lincoln did, but it's a fascinating story at a certain point in his life, and that's what I'm covering. Thank you so much. <laughs>